On today's episode... One of the complicating factors, which I think is underappreciated, is, you know, the performance of multinational companies was actually pretty lousy well before the trade war kicked off. Actually, there was a very clear deterioration in profitability, and that actually clouds the question a bit because some of the best performing businesses in the world have been domestically focused American companies with very profitable home markets rather than the kind of globally active business. Welcome to the Active Share podcast that explores less obvious investing insights in a world that's always changing. I'm your host, Hugo Scott Gore. Today, I am delighted to have with me Patrick Files from The Economist, where Patrick is the business affairs editor. Previously, he wrote the Schumpeter column, was New York bureau chief, and set up the editorial bureau in Mumbai. Before all of that, he was the deputy editor of the Lex column at the Financial Times, and before that, he was a telecoms analyst at UBS. Patrick, welcome and thank you for joining me. Hi, Hugo. Great to be here. Now, I'm assuming you're in a good mood because we're doing this on a Friday, and it's Thursday nights that you go to print, and I imagine that's pretty manic. Yeah, so we have this weekly cycle. So this is the most relaxed part of the week for us. The edition has just been published. It's circulating around, and we haven't yet got to the point where we have to dream it all up again for next week. Yeah, I was going to ask, when does the adjutor start? When does the next deadline horizon begin to bite? Well, it's sort of, it, certainly in the weekly cycle, there's a kind of relaxed chat on Fridays about what the news is, what stuff we've got cooking. And then on Monday, it all gets deadly serious on Monday morning because everything has to be tied down reasonably firmly. And then there's a couple of days when everyone is writing and then we start again. So it's a very, very distinct weekly cycle. Yeah. And so actually, before we get into the big topics, I thought we could talk a little bit more around process. Just how do you as an organization really decide what to write about and when to write about it? How does that sort of longer term, we just talked about the weekly cycles, but how does the longer term process work? Yeah, I mean, so in the abstract, and there is, I think, probably a bit of a parallel with investing here, but you've got to kind of identify where we might have an edge as a publication. And it usually comes from one of three areas. You know, one is where we feel we are simply ahead. So we have thought of something that no one else has. And that's interesting in its own right if our judgment is correct. The second kind of interesting article is when it's very contrarian. So there's a sort of accepted wisdom about a subject and maybe an accepted sort of empirical view of it. And we disagree with that strongly. And again, that's gold dust, if you're right. And then the last kind of edge for us, I think, is where we have a different kind of information from the competition. And that could be some sort of data exercise, or it could be potentially that we've got interviews or spoken to people and have fresh information. So typically, it comes from one of those three things. But you then also have the issue of timing. And as you intimated, journalistically, it's possible to be too early with an idea. So what you think is a fantastic sort of intellectual breakthrough, the timing's not right, it's not on people's minds. So that's a very subjective judgment, but absolutely crucial. And the holy grail is the combination of a piece where we have some sort of edge, but also where it's kind of perfectly timed so that readers are keen to look at it at that particular day. In preparing for this, I looked at the covers from the last 50 editions to see what you've actually written about. And maybe there are no surprises for guessing which person features the most frequently, which is President Trump. But thematically, technology, both big tech firms and the disruptive impacts of technology was the most regular thematic area that I saw, whereas actually banks and finance only featured once, which was a a surprise to me as well. So I want to come on to technology in a minute. But first, maybe we can delve into what you dubbed slobalization. So slobalization, what do you mean by that? And kind of what's the evidence for it? Well, what we mean by that is the big global trend of the last sort of 25 years of greater global integration economically and financially going into reverse. We call it slobalization because it's not quite high speed reverse gear. It seems to be sort of kind of fading a bit gradually. And it's interesting if you look, there are different measures, but you know, if you look at say trade, cross-border lending, cross-border portfolio flows, those are the measures which really seem to be clearly going backwards. I should add to that investment by multinational companies across borders. There are some other metrics which are going the opposite direction, most notably kind of digital flows, which is something McKinsey, the consultancy, have bigged up. But I think the overall picture is 
having spiked very dramatically over kind of 20 years, were now in mild reverse gear on most of these measures. And it has quite big implications, I think, for how the global economy works. And is that inevitable or is it more political policy driven? In terms of is it inevitable because emerging market countries are getting better at making things for themselves as technologies diffuse globally, they become available to everyone. There's more, I guess, easier to do things for yourself. Or you could also argue that actually as Western economies become more services driven, that is a slightly sort of deglobalizing trend as well. So is it actually kind of an inevitable thing or is there some policy making which is causing it? Well, one answer to that is if you look back over the last sort of 20 or 30 years, what stimulated globalization? And there's no question part of it is technology driven. So, you know, things like the containerization of shipping in the 1980s, cross border telecoms, the price collapsing over the same time period. And, you know, that had a big impact. But on the other hand, liberalization of finance, the collapse in tariffs, the entry of China into the WTO were also very significant events. So I think inevitably, you are left with a balance of both the kind of commercial and technological impulse of the world. And I think you're right there, some of the things which pushed for integration are now kind of domesticating a bit. But you've also got the policy side of things. And I think there's no question this big kind of rupture to the global system will ultimately, I think, have quite a profound impact on how companies and investors work. And it's not one that's very easy to judge at the moment, but I think is really one of the big, probably the big question in economics over the next sort of decade. Yeah. And I guess that's a difficult thing when something you've grown up with and used to see as a step change, there's a regime shift. That's a difficult thing to process and discount, particularly when you're unsure what it looks like. But maybe one consequence, or maybe the big consequence of globalization, deglobalization, is balkanization. And balkanization would have all sorts of impacts, but certainly when you think about investing and investing globally, if the world is being divided up into quite, not necessarily sort of hermetically sealed parts, but it's with less movement between these spheres, whether it's, as you said, goods, people, capital, ideas, IP, if there are higher frictions, that definitely has to have some quite serious implications for, certainly when you think about multinational companies, which were in many ways the sort of the poster children of the era of accelerated globalization. Yeah. And one of the complicating factors, which I think is underappreciated, is, you know, the performance of multinational companies was actually pretty lousy well before the trade war kicked off. You know, so if you look at the kind of returns on capital that very global businesses were generating in 2005, 6, 7, and then two or three years after the crisis, actually, there was a very clear deterioration in profitability. And that actually clouds the question a bit, because some of the best performing businesses in the world have been domestically focused American companies with very profitable home markets, rather than the kind of globally active business. But notwithstanding that, I think longer term, the kind of unwinding of global supply chains and businesses that are active all around the world is a process that's really just begun. And if you look at the world's biggest companies by market cap, both the tech firms and some of the very big, more traditional companies, you know, almost all of them have some sort of global business integration that's key to how they operate. And often we actually just don't know what's going to happen. And Apple is the sort of fantastic example, right, where it should be dramatically affected by this. But it's a a question that's almost too hard to answer. And as a result, in some ways, I think the stock market has just given up trying to answer it until the evidence becomes a bit clearer. Yeah, well, that makes sense. It's very hard to precisely identify these consequences. But Maybe sometimes it's worth just looking at kind of what were the benefits and just subtract the benefits rather than trying to exactly work out what it looks like. My next question really is a follow on from that, which is you've written extensively and were early in my view around the increased concentration of corporate profits, especially in the US. And I think there's now pretty much consensus that definitely has occurred, that there has been a greater concentration of profits, that more industries have looked like winner takes all kind of industries. So. What do you think are the reasons for that? Why did that occur? And then we'll go on to what should be done and what could be done, which are not necessarily the same thing. Some of it is related to an enormous M&A wave, you know, over 20 years. And that happened partly, I think, 
one's being honest because the antitrust regime in the US became much laxer. So there was a big kind of intellectual shift in the judicial system and the regulators in the 80s towards a a more laissez-faire kind of attitude. And then the second sort of underlying factor, which is clearly most pertinent in tech, is the emergence of these kind of big scale digital businesses, which in, in some respects, I think are really natural monopolies. And that's a sort of technological change, which I think explains some of the monopolistic tendencies in the US, as opposed to some kind of policy mistake. This is what capitalism is supposed to do, that big companies get bigger, either acquire their competitors or or put their competitors out of business. Is it necessarily bad if you look at inflation? Corporate profits may have got more concentrated and big companies may have got bigger, but I don't see an inflation problem, big increase in the cost of goods, or is it actually, it's not the rate of change, it's that some things cost more than they should do because of concentrations? Well, there's a set of economic problems that have been around for 10 years, and they include very low productivity growth, inequality and the relatively high share of profits that flow to capital, which by definition means less flows to labour. You know, economists have been struggling to understand some of the explanations for that and the various views like secular stagnation. And I think in a way competition and monopolies is the kind of super theory that would appear to explain quite a lot of this. So I think in terms of does it matter You could look at it statically and say, well, the high profits firms generate today, well, if we gave a chunk of those profits to workers, you know, the world would be more equal, which might or might not be a good political goal. The thing to think about, I think, which is more important is the relationship between competition and productivity. So if you have a very competitive system, I think that ultimately does drive productivity, which is ultimately what drives wealth. And on many measures, the US seems to have become less competitive. You know, the birth and death rate of firms, the level of Mm. dynamism, the volatility of returns on capital, the persistence of returns, as well as the concentration argument. And I think that overall picture is not great. Now, you do raise a good question, like, isn't this supposed to be kind of what the purpose of business is, right? You come up with a better business model, you crush the competition, you make money. The most interesting view on this, I think, is actually Joseph Schumpeter, the Austrian economist, after whom the economist column is named. His view of competition was rather than a day-to-day process, you had, this is his famous creative destruction, but you had sort of windows where monopolies were created, and then someone just comes up with a better idea that blows away those incumbent companies. So there are moments of sort of monopolistic behavior and the high profit pool eventually tempts in a new generation of competitors. So I think if you look at it in a more sort of static sense, things have deteriorated quite a lot in the US. The big question is whether this is a sort of window of excessive profitability, which tempts in a whole new generation of business models which blow apart today's superstar firms. And we don't know the answer to that. Yeah, because you could argue there's a pattern from history that when you have a meaningful number of new technologies or new technologies are just beginning to be diffused through the economy, you do have supernormal profits, but they then either get competed away by the market, which is the technologies are fully diffused and they're abundant. And so everyone has access to say excellent communication technology, it could be transportation. And so that the market finds solutions or you do need some extra intervention, which comes from government regulatory. And usually when you get greater competition, you get a productivity surge. And certainly there's an argument now that we're kind of pregnant with productivity. There are lots of new technologies, but they haven't fully diffused yet. They haven't fully sort of adopted and adapted, but they will be soon. And therefore there could be a productivity surge. So this is just one of those periods where the kind of the market's catching up with some supernormal profits that are the early fruit from new technologies. Do you have faith in the market solving this or do you think it needs intervention? I think what you describe is right. And in fact, the productivity figures in the US, you know, have picked up more recently after a pretty dismal decade, although they're still quite sluggish by historical standards. I mean, I think there are two reasons to be worried. One is actually the valuations placed on the tech stocks themselves, because I think, you know, the market, if you assume it has some kind of insight, is not pricing in the idea that these things are disrupted over any reasonable time frame. So they're viewed as as sort of perpetual profit machines 
that's very striking. I mean, the market is essentially discounting the share of corporate profits will rise pretty significantly. The other thing is that the behavior of the big tech firms themselves, I think you could argue, has become defensive and to a degree predatory in order to avoid the disruptive process you describe. And in particular, this idea of the kill zone where the big tech firms take over small competitors that might pose a threat in adjacent industries. And if you look at what might happen with regulation, I suspect in the US it's not going to be turning you know, Facebook or Google into utilities that are, the government regulates, but it probably will try and restrict that kind of predatory behavior, for example, by banning the big tech firms from doing takeovers of rivals. And do you think the rules are slightly different for the characteristics of a digital economy versus a physical analog economy, that actually the rules are a little bit different, whether it's the speed of adoption, speed to whatever, whether it's a billion users, 500 million users, that digital scale is a different thing. And that's a harder concept to try and regulate or even to try and apply existing rules to. Yeah, well, there's several things that are new. I mean, one is the idea you can get a 2 billion person customer base in you know roughly 10 years which is what facebook's done the other is of course the way you pay for goods is different than in the past so we pay with our data rather than with money and that's something the antitrust regime in the u.s finds incredibly hard to deal with it just doesn't fit into its doctrine but i think you know at the end of the day i think the test that should be applied to these businesses is actually one of of sort of economic size, you know, the gross value added, for example, which is sort of profits before labor costs. But there are some pretty obvious tests that one should apply. And there's also a pretty obvious group of four or five companies that tip over that threshold of becoming extraordinarily large by any historical standard. And actually, we at The Economist looked back a while ago, comparing the size of the big tech firms to previous Monopolists, the East India Company in Britain, Standard Oil, U.S. Steel at the turn of the century in the U.S., IBM, Microsoft in the later half of the 20th century. And it's pretty clear the tech firms will tip over into that territory over the next few years if their valuations are correct. And I think, therefore, one doesn't need to believe in a new system of measurement of monopolies to be worried about their size. If a company is so big that it can issue its own currency, does that make it not a company but almost like a country? Yeah, I mean, I think you'd find the technical experts would question whether Facebook's Libra is a currency or maybe it's more like an ETF that you know holds underlying assets and itself is tradable. But I think the bigger point you're making is totally right. I mean, it's interesting in the US, the two big concentrations of sort of business power have been Wall Street and Silicon Valley, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years. And what you might see is the kind of combination of Wall Street and Silicon Valley embodied in one firm, you know, JP Morgan plus Amazon. And I do think that probably is unprecedented. It does have, weirdly, some parallels in the emerging world, you know, Korea's Chai Bowl or the kind of classic Asian conglomerates that cross several different sectors and I think have posed quite big problems politically in those countries because of their scale of power. Taking the other side though, if you look at big tech, they're big employers, they're very big spenders on research and development, they're actually as a percentage you know, extremely big relative to other public companies, their share of capex capital investment is very high, they're hiring a lot of people, they're spending a lot of money, they're positive pulse for the economy. I think that's right, although it is interesting that, again, go back to the same point, but the stock market valuation, I think the stock market's love affair with these businesses is essentially the monopolistic properties of their core activities rather than applying some huge valuation to some of the speculative stuff they're up to. I mean, you know, Alphabet's other bets division, which includes its experimental, more innovative activities, I'm not sure is something that people accord an enormous value to. The one interesting thing, you know, which is worth dwelling on is that the complaint from economists is these companies have sort of surplus profits. In economists speak means they save too much. You know, they're a source of excess savings, which might depress demand, among other things. And it is interesting, actually, the free cash flow of the big tech firms has not been growing because they've been reinvesting very heavily in the last three or four years. So you had a kind of surge when their free cash flow became 
a significant share of GDP, or at least sort of registered as a number. But instead of growing, that's actually flatlined over the last two or three years because of the reinvestment. And reinvestment is probably one of the strongest defenses the companies have. Investment is good. Yeah. Just cycling back to something we were talking about before, which was kind of this idea that maybe capitalism can help save capitalism by being more capitalist, more competition. So more competition could actually resolve the high concentration of profits and it could certainly resolve some of the issues we touched on. So if capitalism is due something of a reset to make the case for it, what could that reset look like? If short-termism is on the way out, then what comes next instead? If the idea of a company exists solely to maximize profit for shareholders is now kind of, as it is, I think it's 40 years ago, that was written by Friedman. If it is out of date, what comes next? There's different threads of that. There's one thing that's happening is kind of a cultural revolution at companies where the pressure from society to change, to be fairer, to be perhaps nicer, is articulated through a kind of culture war where companies are expected to display certain standards on political issues, cultural issues, you know, kind of embody a set of uh, values, which is very different from what Karl Marx predicted, right? The big threat supposedly to capitalism was kind of, let's smash up the companies, let's take the profits. Now the pressure is, well, does the CEO say the right thing in response to a particular controversy in the culture wars in America? And in a way, if that's all it is, I think that's great for big business because they can handle that no problem. The sort of signaling and PR basically required to cope with that, I think is slight. But on the other hand, I think there's a couple of other strands. I mean, one is what you might call new left-wing policies that clearly are attack capital. So, you know, Elizabeth Warren has talked about workers on boards in the US. In Britain, you've got the Labour Party, which supports giving workers a share of the equity of big companies and nationalising some assets. And I think that's a sort of second thread, which is a more conventional attack. But there is this really interesting question, I think, of... If the political system is broken down and is ineffective, whether it's legitimate for people to pursue their political aims through the corporate sector. So if you like, society is at the top comprised of tens of millions of people and they vote, but many of them also own shares. And, you know, if it's okay for them to ask for a certain set of objectives through the political system, why shouldn't they use their votes in companies to push business to do the same thing? And particularly if the political system is not effective, which seems to be the case in many places. So I do think that's the really tricky question. What if the ultimate beneficiaries, the ultimate shareholders in business, want business to do something different, want business to behave more responsibly towards the environment, for example. I think it's quite hard to argue they shouldn't be allowed to express that through the corporate control system. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. So do you think that it will be an increasing part of any investment thesis that actually this company, is it good? Does it do good? Is what it sells good? Is how it makes it good? Is the whole broader footprint around it good? That this sort of being seen to be good and being good will become important. And it's not just going to be one thing, it'll be the whole kind of how the company fits together and all the things it touches. Do you think that's going to become a much bigger part of, for an investment, the investment thesis, and for a company, the sustainability of its, of its business, business model and its returns? Absolutely. And I think there's the tempting but foolish thing to do is look at the kind of ESG movement and point out its obvious hypocrisy and nonsense, of which there's an enormous amount. And, you know, we have lots of companies coming through The Economist, and we almost always ask them, you know, do you take ESG seriously? Do you feel that investors who have an ESG mandate say anything coherent? And quite often, the answer is incredibly critical. But having said that, I do think, you know, you could construe a case that it's really worth paying attention to. And one is because thinking about the social context of business is probably a proxy for good governance. You know, thinking carefully about the world is what good companies do. Secondly, because I think you can make more money if your customer base is ultimately interested in greener products or more safely produced products, then maybe you can sell more things. And then lastly, to go back to your Milton Friedman point, you know, the key thing I think a profit maximizing business should do is operate within the law today, but also anticipate how the law and rules change. 
that's actually a sort of shareholder value maximizing thing. So, you know, it was a bad idea to have been in the coal industry 10 years ago and well-run profit maximizing businesses would have anticipated the rules around coal would have, would have changed. And does that require, my favorite Charlie Munger quote, of which there are many is, show me the incentives, I'll show you the behavior. Is that an issue of incentives still aren't quite right? The incentives still are inherently short-termist for most companies, CEOs, boards, and that you do need a shift in incentives, or actually is it just just sound strategic practice to think longer term? Well, you've raised Charlie Munger. I should tell you my favorite quote, which uh, I hope I get this right, but he was asked what he thought of executive pay consultants, and he paused and then said, I cannot begin to express my contempt. (laughs) But yeah, incentives. I mean, I think big companies are very aware of this and are balancing the kind of demands, fashionable demands, perhaps with a more realistic view of how the rules around business will change. I do think there is a time horizon issue, which is, you know, most savers are or should be interested in a kind of decade plus time frame to their investments. And yet the intermediation layer of finance, partly for cynical reasons, partly because the customers don't do what's in their own best interest, you know, has shortened the time span of or the holding periods of a lot of investments. And that is particularly relevant for climate, I think, where if you believe the analysis, we're looking at a kind of 20-year to 30-year time frame for carbon emissions to fall. And it is simply a fact that falls beyond the horizon of most institutional investors. And finding a way to fix that incentive problem, I think, is probably quite important. I mean, in other words, if the ultimate savers in the system had real control over the time horizon, I suspect they would be quite concerned that the terminal value of the oil and gas industry might be zero by you know, 2045. But it doesn't seem to be a problem the institutional investment world is too concerned about yet. One last theme, and then we'll get on to some economist-specific questions. So the Economist magazine has been around for, I think you're on your 176th year now. You've seen the political pendulum swing multiple times. How far do you think it has swung or is going to swing this time around? And what I'm really thinking about there are things like MMT, modern monetary theory, the potential politicization of central banks. So there's a direct economic implication and a finance industry implication. But it feels like the pendulum is definitely swinging and pendulums are heavy things and they don't just stop. I think that's totally right. I mean, The Economist was actually founded to promote free trade That was our original purpose and something we've held true to. And internally, I think we're very aware that while our editorial line on certain subjects, particularly the idea of openness economically and its benefits, while our line has been relatively consistent, we've been in and out of fashion. So, you know, The Economist in the 1970s was a kind of heretic rebel voice on economics and politically. And then in the sort of late 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, we were completely mainstream. So what we said was kind of what the world's elites already thought. And there's a sense now again in which our editorial lines are are again sort of more in tension with what the political system produces. So these sort of ebbs and flows over time, I think, are definitely there. And, And maybe there's sort of 20 or 30 year cycles. I mean, it is interesting. And you've had a very stable sort of low growth period with the economy kind of trundling on a relatively steady trajectory. Yet at the same time, the possible parameters of economic policy have been blown apart. And you have, you know, obviously on the left, there are things like MMT and the New Green Deal, which seems to be a kind of recipe for massive state intervention in the economy. And then on the right, you have Donald Trump is indeed on the right, but, you know, he sort of protection is disrupting institutions like the Fed Mm -hmm. and so on. And I think there's further to go. And I think if you look back in history, there are these moments. I mean, the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in the late 60s, early 70s, the emergence of monetarism as a way of running the economy in the early 80s. After that, inflation targeting becoming fashionable. So we think of the existing economic policy making framework as quite a sort of fixed thing. Whereas in fact, you know, if you look back in history, there've been enormous changes. And I expect we have really quite big changes to how the economy has run coming. And so if we are, the pendulum's 
is swinging some things that were thought been possible or highly unlikely five, ten years ago, Nancy, possible that you may well see in sort of Western economies, central bank financing of fiscal expansion. That would be quite a big change and would have many investment implications. Is that something where just because it's being talked about, you feel you need to weigh in? Or is that something when you talk about it, it's because you think actually this is a increasing possibility, if not a probability? Well, sort of sociologically or anthropologically, it's really quite interesting to watch that debate in particular. So what you have is clearly there's a sort of fringe which has a really extreme position. So the Green New Deal or MMT, which is essentially kind of throwing out the textbook completely on economics. But if you look actually nearer the centre, there's definitely been a clear shift among the US economic establishment that maybe fiscal deficits are okay. You know, there is a sort of body of thought that you should run bigger deficits, real interest rates are really low, spend the money on, you know, infrastructure investment. It's worth looking at the extremes because they tell you where the centre bends towards. Mm -hmm. And we're in one of those phases now. And fiscal policy is a good illustration. I mean, it hasn't hit continental Europe yet, the idea of going on a big fiscal stimulus. But I think, whereas the US clearly has quite a high deficit at the moment. But I think, again, if you see another recession, that's when all of this stuff is going to kick off. And suddenly, the idea of a big fiscal expansion as an alternative to another QE session, I think, will become totally mainstream. Yeah, yeah. So I want to slightly shift gear a bit and ask some some questions really about you guys at The Economist. So and what you cover changes over time as, as the economy changes and as, as the world grows at different speeds. So how do you achieve diversity of thought and experience that is relevant to your whole sort of addressable market? And what I mean by that is, as you write more and more about Asia, or as you write more and more about China, you definitely need different voices in the room and different life experiences, specializations, etc. So how do you kind of achieve a diversity of thought and experience, but at the same time sort of staying true to the sort of the founding principles of The Economist? Well, there are these big cycles. And if you look back over our history, and in fact, quite near where I sit, we have every copy of The Economist since the first one in a huge bookshelf, which you can go back and flick through. And it's clear there are these moments. I mean, we were really focused on the Cold War in the 1980s. You know, that was really, really important and what people wanted to read about. In the financial crisis for two years, we had, you know, almost saturation coverage of the economy and finance. In the last couple of years, it's clearly been very sort of populism driven, the idea of the political systems changing. So there are these shifts. In terms of how do you sort of have the self-discipline to make sure that you are covering the world properly and not being driven by a kind of internal agenda. And I think you know, part of that's how you hire people and there needs to be kind of relatively independent minded people as well as you know, people hopefully from lots of different backgrounds around the world. And we've always been quite good at that. And you know, the ideal journalistic hire is someone who's a bit of an intellectual rebel and wants to challenge consensus and not necessarily a kind of analyst. There is a difference between the two. We changed the composition of the paper over time as well. So we didn't used to have a China section, now we do. We didn't used to have a China column, now we do. And by tilting the balance on that, you can force yourself into a different area. And then the last thing is, you know, the kind of thing all organizations need to do, but having a kind of self-critical mindset, which is, you know, by and large, a matter of culture. The Economist's anonymity as a publication is very helpful because everyone has a kind of collective sense of, you know, responsibility, which in turn means that, that people feel, you know, it's perfectly okay to speak up if you think something's rubbish or crap or wrong. You know, we're not siloed. So there is a sort of sense of being broadly accountable to each other, both for getting things right and if we're making mistakes, being told so. And when you post more some we wrote about this, we thought it was going to be very big. How do you then say, well, actually, we might have got that wrong. In our industry, we're never wrong, we're just early. Do you do that as a discipline to sort of say work? What didn't, and did you look at outcome or process? The test is different in journalism. So one of the most common complaints you'll hear about The Economist is, particularly with the prices of assets, that you know, when the housing crisis is 
just bottoming out, that's when The Economist will run a cover on housing or, you know, when... India's boom is peaking, you know, that's when The Economist runs a cover, you know, look at India's boom. So the test is a bit different because we're not there necessarily to sort of anticipate asset prices. Mm -hmm. We're there to cover intelligently the things people are interested and need to know. So I think that in terms of sort of getting asset prices right or wrong, it's just a different situation. On the bigger questions of the big economic trends, and political issues. Yeah, you know, you we get things wrong, but I think ultimately our purpose is to inform and engage our readers rather than perform like an asset manager yeah. does. And I think it's where the analogy breaks down a bit. I think if we felt we were being very boring or simply tedious in our analysis, that's a really big failure. Being interesting, rigorous and wrong is not a problem for us, ultimately. It would be clearly better to be interesting, rigorous and right. But we should be taking some risks intellectually. That's our job. Could you talk a bit about how technology has changed, if it has changed, what you do and and how you do it? And maybe the provocative question is, will there ever be a machine writing Uh, machine learning learns how to write like an economist writer, which is a very high bar, but does learn it in the end. And you'll have articles written, not by humans. Well, it's already the case that parts of journalism have that and, you know, elements of financial journalism, instant reporting of statistics and things on the wires already basically use computers. And we do the exercise quite regularly of getting a programme to write an economist article and was relieved it's still largely incoherent. But, you know, technology changes, I think, really what customers, you know, readers want and how they consume information. And clearly a bit of that is, you know, the shift to a very mobile phone-centric way of consuming information, which is partly about the device, but also the sort of pattern of how people read things. And I suspect over the next few years, more customization is the way things go. So, you know, your phone knows that you're interested in Asia and, you know, mergers and acquisitions and Canadian politics and feeds you that. But the, you know, really are of all of the publications around, I think we've always aimed to be a kind of concise, clever snapshot of the world rather than a device that spews what you think you want to know at you. So the idea of a package of content, a bit of luck when you read it, a bit of spontaneity, unpredictability is quite important to us. And I suspect that that will never disappear. So the idea of The Economist as a package Mm -hmm. rather than just as a flow of random articles about subjects. Final question. Is it true that the most important meeting of the week at The Economist is when you all sit down and compare your headlines, captions and puns? Well, this is, you know, you can always tell someone who's a born journalist because they find the process of having punning headlines or photo captions just basically the most important and enjoyable part of their job. So we spend a lot of time poring over this. But yeah, they, we, well, we have two big weekly meetings which are, are uh, partly about process and partly about ideas. And usually at those, the, the sort of often at those the good puns are raised and and widely admired. So one week we had Christine Lagarde moving from the IMF to the European Central Bank and the the sort of pun of the week was our story on the future of the IMF which was called Changing of Lagarde. It's very good, very good. I'd say it's almost (laughs) pun-believable. Patrick, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been A pleasure to have you, and it's been extremely interesting, particularly in learning a bit more about how the the sausage gets made. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to today's episode of The Active Share. To hear additional insights from William Blair Investment Management, visit us at blog.williamblair.com. The Active Share is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and TuneIn. For questions, comments, or topics you'd like to hear discussed, email us at podcastim at williamblair.com.
This content is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended as investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any security or to adopt any investment strategy. Investment advice and recommendations can be provided only after careful consideration of investors' objectives, guidelines, and restrictions. The views and opinions expressed are those of the speakers as of the date of this recording, are subject to change without notice as economic and market conditions dictate, and may not reflect the views and opinions of other investment teams within William Blair Investment Management. Factual information has been obtained from sources we believe to be reliable, but its accuracy, completeness, or interpretation cannot be guaranteed. Any discussion of particular topics is not meant to be comprehensive and may be subject to change. This material may include forecasts, estimates, outlooks, projections, and other forward-looking statements. Due to a variety of factors, actual events may differ significantly from those presented. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal. Any investment or strategy mentioned herein may not be suitable for every investor. References to specific companies are for illustrative purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any security. William Blair Investment Management may or may not own any securities of the companies referenced. It should not be assumed that any investment in the companies referenced was or will be profitable.